but up till now what happens is that for getting information of a blockchain and the events that are inside it and like you know the call data information and everything the graph node or the ingestion blog actually goes and uh, asks rpc to get that information to you so basically the rpc serves the information that hey this is the first block this is what has happened inside the block and the ingestor node actually listens to a particular event and processes it for you but what we think is that this is a linear process first of all the rpc has to be very very efficient once and that's like you know really tough to find once that rpc gets the information the second thing is this processing that information which graph node does and then you know querying that it is very linear ingestion uh, processing and querying this linear process how do you scale that for subgraphs like superfluid and uniswap the answer is that you need to create a flat file ecosystem which has dripping architecture in indexing so superfluid is great in dripping uh, payments the graph with its new software of substreams is great in dripping data to you in parallel compute units so basically instead of linearly processing this information substreams and firehose uh, combination as a software parallelizes this in a, this kind of a thing so that you can get information in a more efficient manner that you know we'll discuss in the future Hello and welcome to another episode of Devs Do Something. I'm your host, Sam Flamini, and today we have a special episode that includes a deep dive on the graph with Pranav from the graph team and also Vincent from Superfluid. So Vincent's the senior engineer on the Superfluid team who has built our subgraph that uh, is used by everyone who builds on top of Superfluid. And the episode features really a deep dive into the graph and how the graph works, right? So everything from like how to Build your own subgraph, like best practices for doing that, how the graph indexer actually works under the hood, and even a lot of alpha uh, on the decentralized network that's coming out soon is, is something we also discussed. So that is really what Pranav helped us cover. And then Vincent gave a full deep dive into how we've actually approached building our subgraph as superfluid as kind of like a case study example. Right, so we've gotten good compliments on that from both the graph team and, and elsewhere. And I thought it'd be helpful to get Vincent's first person perspective on things like setting things up to uh, go get things like event entities. We also have these higher, higher order level entities that we've also built uh, that I think have been great abstractions for both myself building on top of Superfluid and others. So yeah, this episode is a, a great deep dive into the graph for those of you who are not uh, as familiar. And it's also a great introduction into what's next with the decentralized network, right? So the graph team are building a lot of, of different infrastructure pieces to make the decentralized network actually happen and come to life in the way they want to. And we go into all those things. So if you're interested in all of that, I think you're gonna love this episode. The graph is a critical primitive to really understand if you wanna build in Web3. Uh, it's about time that we had someone from the graph on. So with that said, sit back, relax, and enjoy the episode. As devs, we all love hackathons. They're a great way to boost your skill set, meet other engineers, and add to your portfolio of work. At Superfluid, we've sponsored many hackathons and decided to start putting on a hackathon of our own, the Superfluid Wave Pool. This hackathon is a little bit different though in that it's continuous, it's always open. You can submit any project built on Superfluid at any point throughout the month and have a chance to earn thousands of dollars in prizes depending on how your project stacks up. In just the last couple of months, we've seen dozens of teams build really amazing projects that run the gamut from super fluid developer tutorials to full-fledged applications uh, to a proof of concept super fluid Starknet implementation that we thought was really, really impressive. So we encourage you to check it out today. You can learn more by going to superfluid.finance slash wavepool. That's superfluid.finance slash wavepool. Happy hacking. All right, we are here today with another episode of Devs Do Something, and we have uh, two new faces here. We have one, our, our guest from The Graph, we have Pranav. Welcome, Pranav. 
And we also have Vincent, who is uh, a senior smart contract and Web3 engineer at Superfluid. Uh, and Vincent's here to become, be our kind of resident expert uh, on the graph at Superfluid because he's actually built our subgraph for our team. So great to have you both here. Um, we'll start off with, with Pranav. Um, we, we really appreciate you being here. Uh, and, you know, the first question we like to ask every guest that comes on is how they got into Web3. So I'd love to understand how you got into this space. Ah, uh, it's, it's, it's hell of a story, but I'm going to attempt to like, you know, give you a brief. Normally people get into crypto when they get dragged by crypto or, or somebody told them about Bitcoin thingy. But somebody in my, like, you know, I used to live in Bangalore and somebody told me that there is this exciting hackathon happening in the city which has the highest bounties of all time, like $1,000 to $1,000. It, it was a good amount back in those days, uh, pre-bull market era, right? <laughs> it was, a, it was a, a good time back then. Uh, so like, you know, I got to know about Ethereum and the crypto and the Web3 world in general because of a hackathon known as ETH India 1.0 that was organized by ETH Global. And uh, that got me really hooked up because uh, the whole community in general was very excited about what they were building. And the protocols, like they had the CEOs and the CFOs all there building with the developers, understanding what the protocol could unlock by the lens of the developers. And that's what like, you know, really, really got me excited about the whole ecosystem. And uh, after completing the hackathon, uh, I got some like, you know, really awesome, like people were really generous enough to give me some smart contract uh, freelance work. I did that for about a an year and that uh, was that went well. And eventually I started working for a chain known as Matic that eventually we know now as Polygon. Uh, back in those days, it was known as Matic Network. So I started working with them and they had this plasma chain kind of a thing. Uh, which eventually made, uh, they made a POS chain and now they have a ZK EVM. So, the, uh, so, so I started working uh, in Web3 and crypto because of a hackathon and I stayed because of the Ethereum community and now I'm still working because of uh, the love, oversharing love that Web3 has been and uh, honestly, my, uh, like, uh, my, my, my more, uh, more as to like, you know, why I want to keep working in Web3 is because uh, I want to see uh, what Web3 can unlock in the future of mankind. I love it. Yeah, got into the space as a result of a hackathon. That's actually becoming more and more common now. I'm meeting a lot of people at hackathons, actually, that uh, are in that position. Um, so how did you end up at, at the graph then? So it sounds like you started your career at Polygon. I guess started your career in Web3 at Polygon. Did some things yeah. there. What, you know, why, why were you interested in the graph? And, and what got you into into things with their team. Yeah, that that's also an interesting story. You already like, you know, uh, know the points. <laughs> so basically, uh, I was working at uh, Matic as uh, the head of solutions, like, you know, working. So basically, we, integrate, we wanted to integrate with all the Web3 infrastructure that is required to make a decentralized application really decentralized. And also like, you know, make the whole backend infrastructure so that the DAP can really uh, be a DAP plus it has all the tools available uh, to uptail on it. And uh, the thing was, what, what got me really hooked up was that uh, the graph was an up and coming project back in uh, those days. And many decentralized applications could not deploy on the Matic chain or the Polygon cha uh, chain because uh, the graph was not initially integrated with Polygon. So that got me really interested that what is this like, you know, key piece of infrastructure that the Matic chain or the Polygon chain is missing. And what is this key piece of infrastructure that dApps really require to be really called a dApp and to make their, like, you know, really build their product uh, well enough. And that's what really got me interested. And I went so deep inside the indexing business that I, like, you know, really uh, bought in the whole concept. So basically, I feel that in blockchains, uh, we normally right now are mostly focused on the right aspect of it. What it means as the is that we want to change the state and for that we want to scale the whole blockchain perspective. But more than changing state, you read the state of a particular blockchain when the product is in production, uh, when the product is in production, right? For example, when you upload, how many times do you upload things on Instagram versus how many times you read stuff from the Instagram? It's like one in 10,000 times, right? That's the kind of ratio. So we are currently thinking about how do we 
scale the writing part of the blockchain while the graph single handedly takes care of the reading part of the blockchain and uh, that like you know concept as a whole is a really powerful thing and a very key infrastructure to making blockchain applications a reality and that's why like you know i got really interested and eventually uh, interviewed for the graph and uh, got a role and it's been like about 2 years and uh, two, 2 years or more than that uh, and yeah i love it yeah you're definitely right about being critical infrastructure and the analogy you just use there with instagram is actually a pretty good point you know, we're all obsessed with, especially devs in this space, we're all obsessed with like deploying contracts, uh, optimizing those contracts, uh, building dApps on those contracts. But how often do people really think when they're first entering the space about how we're actually going to get data, right? That's, that's a huge portion of actually building the application in the first place. Honestly, a lot of communities, a lot of our community members want Superfluid to be deployed on different chains and things like that. And the reality is that like, there's certain infrastructure that we help support that just isn't going to work unless you can use the graph on those places, right? So I, I've definitely seen this firsthand, and so is Vincent. Um, okay, so how we'll kind of break this down here next is I want to ask you kind of like some specific questions about how the graph actually works under the hood. More generally, then we'll kind of dive into like, you know, kind, we'll kind of parse it out and go through things so that developers can get an idea of what's going on behind the scenes. That's something our listeners really like. And then what I want to do is I want to go into uh, Vincent's experience actually building uh, subgraphs themselves. So Pranav, I guess for you, like first, can you give us just like a high level overview of the underlying subgraph imp implementation? Uh, it's a pretty large, interesting code base in Rust. And I think our listeners would be curious uh, to get the breakdown, right? They're users of the graph more than likely, but I think they'd like to understand maybe what's going on under the hood. Yeah, so you, you guys want to know how a subgraph actually indexes blockchain information, right? That's 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 what you want to know? Yeah, so I guess maybe what would be really helpful is like, let's just take a simple sample event, right? Let's say that I transfer an ERC-20 token or I create a stream with Superfluid. Let's actually use the Superfluid example because it'll bridge us into what Vincent is going to discuss later. Let's say I create a stream in Superfluid. There's a bunch of events that are spit off, right? One of them is this like, to flow updated event, right? How is that event actually indexed? What happens underneath the hood? If you could give us a, a breakdown of that, that'd be really helpful. Right. So that that's a very interesting example of how do like you know, so how do graph node actually indexes the event and serves GraphQL information to you guys? So basically, right, you were talking about this event, and that event exists in a smart contract, and that smart contract is deployed on the blockchain, right? So blockchain keeps going, keep going, and eventually what you do is create a subgraph on the graph node suggesting that, hey, this is the smart contract that I'm interested in, and this is the event that I really want to like, you know, get information from. So what graph node does is three things. First, ingestion of data. Second, processing of data. And third, querying of that information, right? Ingestion, processing, querying that information. So basically, when you deploy a subgraph, you tell the graph node that this is the information on the whole blockchain that's important just to me. So graph node, uh, or in general, the most specific part of the graph node, which is the ingestion uh, a node, actually looks at the blockchain and sees if that particular event that you're talking about is actually triggered. And when that particular event is triggered, the raw information that that particular event consists is actually taken like you know it, it is ingested the information is ingested the second thing that happens is that it processes that particular information because that information initially is very raw let's say you have that address you have a uint amount and you have like you know uh, these kind of things you the second step is processing that information in the schema formats that you have listed in the subgraph right so that processes the information from a raw data to a more queryable format. And the third thing you do is that the subgraph gives you an GraphQL API that you actually query for, you know, getting uh, the great dashboards and using it in your internal uh, processing. So basically, graph node is just like, you know, linearly ingesting information, processing the information and serving it for you. It looks very simple, but the thing is just imagine 
for a blockchain which is serving a block every second right the the graph node has to keep a watch on every second that particular block and get that information process it and serve it to you and for uh, applications like superfluid uniswap where you have an event in every particular block it's even crazier because the ingestion node will have to take that information for every particular block process it similar uh, simultaneously query it to you guys but still by then there'll be another block that has to be processed and queried so basically there is a chance that people might you know create a indexer which actually listens to events but the graph node team has actually uh, mastered the processes of what's the most efficient software to actually ingest the information map that information to the correct schema and serve it to you and that's why the graph you know actually indexes the information in the fastest most efficient and thirdly uh, the correct decentralized way to serve your information to you gotcha yeah so i mean it sounds like a lot of the work that the graph team has done is on the ingestion side right the processing side is like actually defined by the creator of the subgraph right so this is like what vincent yeah. has spent a lot of time thinking about and writing right the the schema that you you write actually will define on how the it will define how the the data that was ingested is like like how it will be actually exposed in the end via the graphql api right how is this ingestion actually happening under the hood I, I, the graph node repo is like a it's an open source repo anyone can kind of look at it i think it's written in rust for the sake of speed um can you say anything more about that implementation in and of itself? Like, how is it actually able to take in this many data points and, and process yeah. it effectively? So basically what happens right now, and you know, that's why we have built another software for it, right? Uh, that we are going to discuss in the future, which is Firehose and Substream. I don't want to like uh, uh, go there until you ask that question. But up till now, what happens is that for getting information of a blockchain and the events that are inside it and like you know the call data information and everything the graph node or the ingestion blog actually goes and uh, asks rpc to get that information to you so basically the rpc serves the information that hey this is the first block this is what has happened inside the block and the ingestion node actually listens to a particular event and processes it for you but what we think is that this is a linear process First of all, the RPC has to be very, very efficient once. And that's like, you know, really tough to find once that RPC gets the information. The second thing is this processing that information, which graph node does. And then, you know, querying that it is very linear ingestion, uh, processing and querying this linear process. How do you scale that for subgraphs like Superfluid and Uniswap? The answer is that you need to create a flat file ecosystem which has dripping architecture in indexing. So Superfluid is great in dripping uh, payments. The graph with its new software of substreams is great in dripping data to you in parallel compute units. So basically, instead of linearly processing this information, substreams and Firehose uh, combination as a software parallelizes this, in a, this kind of a thing so that you can get information in a more efficient manner that you know we'll discuss in the future but i just wanted to touch briefly on how the graph makes it even more efficient despite you know the ingestion being quite efficient as of now and maybe serving 95% of defi uh, and most of the nft uh, applications around web3 right now interesting yeah the next question i was actually going to ask you which felt like a kind of natural segue is, is how, how does this scale with chains as they get faster, right? So like, for example, you mentioned like Polygon, right? Polygon, it does, it's producing a lot of blocks much faster than Ethereum main that produces blocks. You can say the same thing about some of the newer ecosystems, right? Like uh, uh, even like Avalanche is pretty fast. I think in the beginning, you know, before they had maybe had more volume, they were touting like the potential for sub second block times, right? Which is kind of strange to even think about, right? Uh, so I, I guess what you're saying is, and what I was going to ask you is like, can you basically make this parallel and scale with that, with parallelization, right? So I'm, I'm assuming that like, if you can unpack Firehose and Substreams a bit more, like how is 
how are these things actually helping to to make this more scalable? Is it is it just using parallelization? Is it like, like if you could unpack that a bit for our listeners, I think they'd, they'd really appreciate it. For sure. I'll, uh, so Substream is going live like, you know, uh, uh, in sometimes in the future, but the docs are available and, you know, you can always get a beta access uh, on Substreams. And that's a very exciting new technology that the graph has, act, the graph ecosystem in general, uh, one of the core devs, which is streaming fast has developed. But I can like, you know, give you, uh, we can start from that question of yours, which is, there are blockchains which have one second block time. So Ethereum is great. It has a seven second block time, which is like something that even linear processing can actually work on if the subgraph is built much, much efficiently. But when you talk about these one second block time uh, chains and even uh, lesser block time uh, 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 chains, like there is this optimism in which a block is a transaction. So if that optimism chain scales that then you know we might have one millisecond block time how do we actually scale that whenever a block is produced you need to ingest that information and for that graph node in the current setup will have to go and talk to that particular rpc so every time it has to bam that particular rpc for the information and that's something we thought that needs to change right if it needs historic information if it needs current information we might not want to go in that RPC and ask the same information for everything. Maybe there are two superfluid subgraphs with just a change in the metadata and they're asking the same thing, but the RPC has to like, you know, respond to them differently. So basically for RPC, it's two answers and they have to go back twice and come back. But in general, it's basically the same information. How do you actually scale that with these fast chains? The simple answer is flat files. It's not like, so basically, Firehose is like converting the blockchain information into granular flat files. So instead of going on that RPC and banging that RPC for the blockchain information in your graph node or whatever indexer you have created yourself, what you do is actually go on the Firehose uh, software. They give you a gRPC, which is at the backend having a flat file ecosystem. So when you query a particular information related to a blockchain. They don't go to the blockchain, ask the information and serve it to you. It is rather a flat file ecosystem, which actually uh, goes there and just searches via a cursor kind of software and gives you the information without touching the blockchain, unless it is the most latest information. And for that single block files are created. Uh, I don't want to go very, very deep into it, but the basic part is that instead of going into the RPC and getting all the information again and again, again and again, what you do is convert that RPC information into flat files so that you can query that information uh, without again and again going to that client and serving the RPC, which is very, very inefficient. So this is how Firehose solves for fast blocks. And the second part that is like once you have that gRPC information, you can parallelize the computation on processing and serving the information. And because initially what we could do is that we could just query RPC for event information and whatnot. With Firehose, we have uh, made like, you know, uh, the, the Firehose software is such that you convert the whole blockchain information, not just events, but even transactions into flat files protobufs. Protobuf is a uh, kind of like, you know, so, uh, it, it's a technical term, but it's more of uh, a way to, uh, it's, it's, it's a kind of schema uh, uh, schema name kind of thing. So basically, uh, you convert them into protobuf data types and get that information uh, uh, to your own servings. And that's where I think the difference lies in making indexing much more granular, but much more faster. So instead of just querying event information, now you are even qu uh, querying transaction information. And that's the difference between substreams and subgraphs. Subgraphs could actually index events, call data, and blocks. And substreams, because of Firehose, plus how substreams are created, which is parallel computation, are able to query even, uh, 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 they are able to query even transactions. That's really interesting. I appreciate the breakdown. Uh, before we move on to our, our next section here, Vincent, do you have any follow-up questions on, on anything Pranav just walked through? 
Yep. Yeah. So for um, the flat files, does does it have to get created like the first time? Um, is there like a first pass through it before it has to be done, or how does that work exactly? So basically, the Firehose architecture is such that you know you have let's say a full node running, right? And from that full node, what you do is create a, a block file, right? That there is a block file for the latest information that's created. And if that's required by the substream or the subgraph that is served via gRPC, if it's not required, that flat file is broken and converted to a more like, you know, uh, that uh, block file is converted to a flat file. So basically, if the latest information is required, that block file serves. If it's not required, it is converted to a more like, you know, wider scope and similarly happens to the next block. Next block is converted to a uh, flat, uh, to a block file. If it is required, it is served. It is not, then it is converted into the larger flat file for that particular blockchain that the Firehose gRPC is creating for you. Okay, so one interesting thing, and so what I want to do, you, you actually gave me the perfect format for this, uh, which is, all right, I want to talk to you in the ingestion process, and then we're going to go into processing and we're going to dive into processing and GraphQL schemas and actually building subgraphs. But before we get into the ingestion stuff and building subgraphs and all that, one thing that uh, you know, there's uh, maybe talk about or pe- things that people that developers think about is like, how do I actually use this infrastructure, right? So the most common way that teams are using the graph is through the hosted service. The hosted service was never the long term. It was never the long-term plan to have everyone use the hosted service, right? The graph is its goal is to be a decentralized network over the long term. But you know, I mean, running these, uh, running these, you know, these systems, it takes some skill, right? Like, you need to have some DevOps skill. You need to basically understand how these these nodes are working. Um, so, can you can you walk us through, like, you know, how should potential like graph node operators and people that want to participate in the, in the decentralized network, like what kind of skill sets should they have? What should they be understanding or thinking about to prepare for when the graph as a network doesn't have a hosted service anymore? It's just a network. And those node operators who do want to participate need to be on their A game and actually really be prepared to serve this ecosystem. Yeah. First off, I'll I'll just give like, you know, a brief description of what's the hosted service and what's the network where the node operators actually come. The hosted service was the first MVP that the graph initially launched in the first graph day back in 2019. And in that, it's like one node operator that was Edge in Node, one of the first core devs of the graph that was serving all the information to like, you know, uh, 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 for you. So basically you create a subgraph. At the back end, we were running this indexer, which is the uh, node operator in the graph ecosystem. And this indexer serves all the information to you. On back, switching from the hosted service to the graph network, which is the way you, uh, which, which is the right way to query information in a decentralized way. It's not just us running an indexer. There are uh, more than 250 indexers right now on the network. And when you deploy a subgraph, at least 20 or 30 based on your curation signal of the subgraph, actually index your subgraph. And these 30 indexers serve the information that you're querying. So there is, instead of one person giving you the information which might be right, which might be wrong, there are a quorum of indexers that serve information, right? And if you're a subgraph developer, all you need to do initially was you need to deploy a subgraph on the graph hosted service. Now what you need to do is deploy the subgraph on the sub, uh, on the graph studio, move it to the network and everything works. But now we are not running the infrastructure. That is, we, we were running on the hosted service. We are, not, we are not running the indexer. Rather, there are group of nodes known as indexers, group of node participants. They are a participant on the graph network known as indexers that run that infrastructure so that you they can serve the GraphQL queries for you. And that indexer is what Sam is talking about. And that particular indexer for running that, of course, there is a DevOps skill that is required. Plus to make profits, you also need to understand the protocol and how that particular uh, like you know protocol works. 
So it's not like, you know, a, a particular blockchain in which you are running a node and you passively earn a particular APY and stuff like that. It's even more interesting. You can earn a variable APY based on your intelligence of allocating as an indexer, allocating to a particular subgraph and, you know, serving their queries. That's the whole difference. So being an indexer is you have to have DevOps skills. What that means is that you have to run graph node. You have to run indexer agent. You have to run the whole DB. Maintain it plus you need to run a monitoring system which is Grafana so that the indexer is never down. Otherwise, your reputation is down on the network and you're not given an opportunity to serve as a query. First, that DevOps skill is required. And secondly, you need to you need to have a deep understanding of the protocol so that you are allocating to the right subgraphs on the graph uh, network and you know basically being served the right kind of apy that is desired that's interesting you also get to kind of make a bet on what kind of data is going to be valuable too right i mean that's kind of that's kind of interesting so basically you know it's based on curation share so more the curation a particular subgraph has that means the community wants more decentralization in that particular subgraph Let's say we have super fluid and that's like, you know, pretty important for the whole ecosystem because you need to be serving the right kind of information for dripping architecture so that everybody knows that they have like, you know, 200 uh, or whatever dollars that they are being served into their particular account via a contract. For that, there'll be more curation from the community on that particular subgraph. If there is more curation, there'll be more indexers with larger allocations putting their allocations on that particular subgraph and you know making it even more decentralized for querying got it yeah i mean that, i think that all makes sense i mean I, so on the on the side of the individual dapp developer though right you know for example right superfluid has a dashboard it's an open open source thing like anybody can come use it uh we don't really want there to be downtime ever, and the the graph is like incredibly important to to the to that dashboard even like working in the first place. The hosted service, you know, it's nice because like you know it's run by a group of people who like we kind of trust to run it. Right, there are some trust assumptions we make there, but I would assume that there are DApps like Uniswap, like really high volume applications that have front ends that need to work very well. They can't have any downtime. I would assume that they would want to have some sort of control over whether or not their own subgraph is being indexed properly, right? So do you think that like people at companies like Uniswap Labs or Superfluid or Compound or Aave, do you think that they'll have people on their teams that actually like are like full-time DevOps folks who are running their own graph indexer and are basically node operators themselves on the protocol or the DAP side? Do you think that this system will be good enough to the point where it's like they won't even need to worry about it at all? I mean, I know that's the ideal, but from like a practical point of view, like how do you see this evolving? And if I'm coming at this with the wrong premises, please, please let me know. Yeah, of course. No, this is, this is pretty interesting question for me too. And uh, basically I feel the answer, like, you know, one, one, one great answer to it, given what has happened in the Web3 ecosystem in the past, is that decentralization is not important unless it is, right? I mean, I mean, un uh, unless there is this black swan event that happens and people come to know that, oh, it was really important. So basically, what I'm coming towards is that the network with you know a deterministic number of indexers serving their their particular subgraph versus one person running their own graph node which might fall down so basically let's say uniswap is deployed on bsc now right and uh, uniswap labs all of a sudden decides to uh, run a graph node although they understand the whole network thing and we uh, totally respect them for that if they decide to run their whole thing and there is a sudden increase in the traffic because there is a centralized person running this, there is a good chance that things might start failing. Versus when Uniswap BSC, when BSC is live on the graph network, it comes there. There are about 30 to 50 indexers indexing that subgraph. And there is a chance that maybe because of the high volatility, 10 or 20 fall down, but maybe 30 of them 
will still be alive and serving the right queries. So basically, in this case, and in general as well, the SLAs of the network might be similar to the uh, SLAs of the person running its own stuff. But when things, you know, go upscale, that's like when uh, blockchains become Visa, when the blockchains become MasterCard, you would want the read queries to be as perfect and the things might scale as crazy as like, you know, what it can get. That's where the graph network actually shines because there are there is no single point of failure. There is more reliability in the whole ecosystem because not just one, but there are a number of really, really, uh, uh, really, really expert indexers indexing your subgraph, not just a particular person who might fail because it's a software. Got it. Yeah, I think it's interesting, right? Um, and And with the when the decentralized network is you know at full scale like if we're zooming out kind of into the like five ten years into the future like like we're discussing now maybe sooner is there like a slashing mechanism if if a if one of these operators refuses to do their job like what what's the economic incentive specifically like i understand that they're going to make money if they provide data properly but is there also like a slashing mechanism as well like how does how does this work yeah, so basically an indexer gets reward in two ways. One is that there is an inflation reward for indexers based on allocation. And secondly, the there is a reward for serving the right queries, right? So th that's the reward that an indexer earns. There is a 3% inflation plus the queries they serve to a particular subgraph that they have allocated, which have, they have been given an opportunity to serve. Because let's say there are 30 indexers, they might be serving a particular set of like you know queries. The way we have protected the ecosystem is that indexers, whenever they close their allocation uh, around every, like, you know, uh, every epoch or let's say uh, a particular epoch, which is around 28 days, he will have to submit a proof of indexing, uh, right? And that's actually um, uh, the software makes sure that the proof of indexing is correct. And that's when the indexer is given a reward. To check that there is proof of the proof of indexing is correct, we have uh, fishermen, we have other bunch of participants optimistically checking that this thing is correct. But eventually, what we want to move towards, which is the more like magical stuff, is also to make sure, not just optimistically, but in general, that that particular indexer which is serving a particular query is correct or not right at that particular time. Just like how the zk tech, tech works. And for that, we have exactly been trying to implement, and the first draft it is already ready. Uh, the zk uh, we we are implementing the zk work so that you can check that the query that the particular indexer is serving is correct or not. We have made like you know a, a combination of zk snark and stack. Uh, I forgot really what it is called, uh, but uh, it's 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 a zk library. So basically, you query that, and you uh, uh, you like you know can prove whether your query is correct or not. That's not possible in centralized indexers at all right now. Even Web two, Google. If you go to Google and search what's the uh, what, what's the best restaurant near me, it will give you results. You cannot actually question that your results were not biased, right? Uh, one of my maybe one of the uh, restaurants were owned by the founder of Google and they are serving that particular information to you, right? You cannot qu uh, question Google right now, but with Web3, with the graph, you can question a particular query, whether it is correct or wrong. And that's the magic of zero knowledge proof technology and the graph network, which is coming along uh, to uh, give you the right kind of queries in the most trusted uh, format. Very cool. Very cool. You're, you're kind of pilling me on the uh, the decentralized network a little bit, uh, Vincent. Any any comments, thoughts, questions uh, about the decentralized network and running nodes? Uh, we got to move on there as fast as possible. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> we got to get our subgraphs on there. Yeah. Uh, I think once there's more support for some of the other networks, we're already uh, we're pretty ready. And uh, for the ones that uh, have support, I think we're, we're already planning on moving over there pretty soon.
the the zk proofs that we have developed is called shell proofs sorry i forgot about it but yeah they are they are called shell proofs that we are developing which is a combination of stark and snark so that you can do verifiable queries i love it yeah if if we have a, a link to that i'll definitely link it in the in the show notes for people that are interested in checking it out there's an interesting like talk by zach on the graph day in san francisco that we did last year that uh, everybody should check out nice Nice. Yep. I just got your link. We'll, we'll definitely we'll definitely post that in the show notes for people that are interested. Um, okay. So that's a lot of information about the ingestion part, right? Node operators take notes. Let's get into the the data processing side, right? Uh, actually, on the DAP side, writing subgraph schemas, all that good stuff. So. Before we get into maybe how we've done things at Superfluid, because I think we have some some interesting insights on this with with the help of Vincent. Pranav, do you have any high level, I guess maybe before we even do this, you know, what is this schema that people have to write? For people listening that have actually not written their own subgraph, what is this and and you know, why do I need it? Yeah. So basically schemas is something that's not new. We didn't invent which is something we have done for most of the indexing work in Web3. We didn't invent schema. Schemas exist since the evolution of internet. So basically, if you want information, all you, all you do is create database schemas that, you know, I want information, but I don't want crap. I want information in the right format, and this is the format I want it in. So schemas is defining what you want in the correct format. Right. That's that that's in GraphQL format. So basically, let's say if I create a very simple 101 uh, voting DAP, right? That's the most oldest since uh, the eternity of uh, Ethereum. A voting DAP. In that voting DAP, you will create a schema for let's say a voter, right? And that voter should have let's say address. He should have. Uh, whether he has voted or not, which is really a boolean, right? The third thing would be the type of voter. So basically, this is a schema. And another schema I will create, which is the vote. And in that vote, uh, it would be a one one particular voter can do one vote. That will be a one-to-one -one relationship, right? And one vote belongs to a particular voter. So that kind of a relationship will exist between these two. And that vote will have, let's say, an ID and which particular candidate it went to then third scheme i can create off is a candidate so this is how you visualize that this is what i want in uh, to query from the smart contract smart contract has voter information candidate information and vote information and from that i want to create the schema so that i can get the voter uh, id i can get the voter persona i can get you know uh, so on and so forth so schema is basically defining what you want from the subgraph via these beautiful GraphQL queries. Got it. And usually this, this is like, you, know, you write the schema in the form of something like a YAML file. Uh, and, you know, this becomes like the format that you want this data to be in, right? You don't want crap. You want useful right. information, like you said. Uh, it, it's written in GraphQL formats. YAML file is like the definition of subgraph. Got it. Okay. Got it. Um, so based on what you've seen after, I'm assuming, supporting lots of teams who are interested in building their own subgraphs, do you have any high level like advice on patterns or uh, like general best practices on writing a useful schema or like actually building your own subgraph? Yeah. And basically I've seen like, you know, as things move from the hosted service to the network in the hosted service, uh, it was like, you know, uh, the graph ecosystem paying for your queries. When things move to the graph network, you pay per query uh, in, in the graph token. And things have got efficient by just the thought of moving from, uh, you know, somebody else paying for your uh, queries to the graph network. But uh, leaving all jokes aside, the thing is that when you're creating a subgraph, you have to be as efficient as when you create a smart contract. When you create a smart contract, you don't define unnecessary variables. You don't do unnecessary looping. You don't do unnecessary like, you know, posting information inside blockchain. Similarly, when you are querying the subgraph information, uh, uh, create, querying the blockchain information by creating a subgraph, 
you don't actually you know do unnecessary querying let's say you need information about five uh, voters you don't you know run a loop of 100 particular voters and then select five you actually make sure that the id is attested to a particular address so that you can get intelligently query the right kind of address by id instead of querying hundreds of hundreds of voters so basically being intelligent around querying and accordingly creating uh, like you know correct subgraphs so you don't do unnecessary polling of data is about creating uh, uh, at a higher level creating efficient subgraphs then you can always like you know do more like in web2 we have lazy loading in uh, in in the graph subgraphs you should like make sure when your tab is not on you're not querying the information uh, you are protecting your graphql api in the correct formats with you know the right kind of attestations so that nobody else queries your information because you're paying in grt for the same uh, also uh, in the current subgraph formats there is a limitation on the blockchain as well so basically there is call data which is the function call and then there are events so event calling is easier than uh, uh, than function calling so when you are creating a smart contract making sure whichever you know information you want to query you create an event for that inside the function instead of querying the whole function that could be one more really really important suggestion so that's that's an overview of like you know don't do unnecessary polling and create a very very specific subgraph with specific schema so that you can query the right amount in the most intelligent way hey, hey. sir i have a quick question actually um is the cost in the decentralized network uh heavier for uh, the querying of the data after or the actual uh, indexing and processing of the data uh, during um, yeah that stage would querying the data from the client side be more expensive than the actual uh, sub subgraph getting indexed um, which which part is yeah for for the people paying in GRT, if that makes sense yeah so basically you're saying that uh is it more expensive to query information than to index yeah, information, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, so basically for, for the, the graph developers only pay for only querying query. information. Okay, you they don't, don't pay for the indexing. Yeah, they don't pay. So, yeah, because it's indexers, they cannot give you the information if they have not indexed it. So for an indexer, they have to index the information, make sure it's ready for querying. And when you query, that's the time when you pay in GRT. You don't pay for. So it's indexing. really most most importantly yeah. when you're using the decentralized service to get your queries really down. So you could actually write really crazy subgraphs because that cost would be put on the uh, the indexer. But I guess they just might not want to index your subgraphs, right? There's that too. So basically, if you have curation, people will index mm -hmm. your subgraph. If they are crazy, they might want to not like you know continue. Uh, 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 indexing it but if there are curation rewards the network is made such that i've never seen a particular indexer not be uh, uh, i've never seen a particular subgraph not being okay. indexed by at least three or four index uh, indexers on the network so the economics takes care of that what you should do is that you should uh, uh, make it efficient so that you're not paying more in grt for a particular gotcha. query and for that you should be efficient hmm. subgraphs Mm. Interesting. So it's actually on the subgraph developer side, like what Vincent does, th the more simple he can make it to query data, the, the easier he can make it for the, the DAP developer or outside developer to get data with like a very efficient query, the better. Right. So Vincent, you have a lot of room to, to go in terms of writing really crazy subgraphs, as long as it's easy for people to query data from it. Um, and I think you've actually done a really good, like, you know, again, Vincent's led our, our subgraph development at Superfluid. You've done, a, you've done a very good job of it. We get good compliments on it all the time. Um, and I personally find it pretty easy to use. So can you walk through, like, how we've actually approached this, just to give people an example? Like, how we've, how did you approach setting up our, our subgraph? Yeah, um, sure. So I guess from a really high level, and to go over it pretty briefly, uh, we have mainly three types of entities, um, event entities, they're called you know, just straight one-to-one -one mapping uh, of emitted events from contracts. And we also have uh, something called higher order level entities. Um, these entities basically capture 
uh, state over a period of time. So they look at multiple events. Uh, for example, we have a something called a stream entity, and this is a higher order level. Uh, it tracks things like the total amount streamed, uh, you know, over the stream's lifetime. So when you open the stream, it's alive. When you close it, it, it dies. Uh, and then we we also have you know like reverse lookups to the different events that may have caused changes uh, to this particular stream. So a lot of these things are quite useful and quite nice. Um, and finally, our last type of entity is the uh, aggregate entity, and these capture uh, the changes of state over the entire time that the server app is alive, basically. Um, and it captures it at a global level, and more specifically at the level of uh, the token. So, for example, we have the token statistic entity, and it tracks a lot of totals, you know, like the total number of streams opened or the total amount transferred for a single token, total amount streamed. So you can get a lot of these really cool um, types of data that, sure, you can uh, build your own custom thing to, or, you know, query all the events since the start of time and then recreate that runtime. Uh, but I think what the graph does and the benefit of the graph, it just becomes really obvious when you look at these higher order level entities and the aggregate entities. Instead of like constructing it at runtime or doing it uh, via custom means, you're leveraging a lot of the great work that they've done. And just this just removes so much developer time needed to like build it and then maintain this infrastructure that enables this. And even if you know, if we were to do it, I would say it's very unlikely we would do uh, anywhere near as good of a job because if uh, one team is spending their waking hours optimizing this and working on this and you're trying to use like just a portion, it doesn't really make sense. Uh, so yeah, that's how we set it up so far. These three main entities. And it sounds like, it sounds like the interesting thing here is like, like you said, Pranav, like, like you're going to have to think about essentially the APIs you're exposing to like end users or like end developers and make it really easy to get data efficiently, right? So doing things like, I think the higher level, the higher order level entities and the aggregate entities, using that to make it much easier to get data so that you basically can cut down the amount of queries, I think is going to be pretty helpful in general. Um, do most teams do that, Pranav? Do you, do you see, is that actually more rare that people will make heavy use of aggregate entities and things like that? What's like the spread on, on how, how often people are trying to do these kinds of things? So like, you know, it's, it's similar to Ethereum. So Ethereum, uh, when I started uh, doing smart contracts, used to cost $1 to deploy a particular subgraph on Ethereum. And uh, that moved from $1 to $180, $1,800 kind of a thing. That escalated quickly. And because things like, you know, moved like that, it became, people started being more efficient on the smart contract work. They did like, you know, less, uh, they, they were they eliminated all the state changes, unnecessary state changes, and so on and so forth. Although that's an Ethereum scaling problem, but when like you know things cost start costing, people start being more mindful, and that was what we also like observed on the hosted service versus the graph network. Initially, there were very intelligent teams which ha which which were very performance conscious, and because we had a linear uh, system up till we had subgraphs and now we have substreams now. Uh, performance should not be a problem but if people were very conscious of how their subgraphs were performing in terms of you know getting the right kind of data in just one second or 0 0.1 second for those particular teams they were being very efficient in their queries but now as things move from the uh, ecosystem paying for queries to uh, paying per query in grt every team has started to being more efficient in their own ways right they have eliminated the wrong uh, uh, querying, stopped over pooling of information and created better or more efficient subgraphs so that they can query the right things and in a much simpler query which they actually require. So moving to the network, it's not just about decentralization, but it's also improved performance of most of the subgraphs as a sub role in a way. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, people are going to have to get used to operating in a world like that's like the rest of Web3, where there's uh, like compute is a scarce resource, right? You have to treat it like so, right? It, it, you know, the exact dynamic you just laid out with the contract costing, you know, very little money to interact with 
to costing a lot of money to interact with, depending on the contract, that dynamic created an entire sport of gas golfing. It created an entire like uh, new category of things that devs needed to think about. And this, the same is going to happen here. Um, and in the, in the end, it's going it's to be for the better. It's going to make Subgrass more efficient. Um, and it's going to be better overall for the decentralization of the ecosystem. So I think it's good. It's, it's going to make things interesting. So it's good to hear. Uh, Vincent, one more question for you before we close things out with Pranav. Is there anything that you wished you would have known when, and maybe Pranav can ask you, can actually chime in here as well. But is there anything you wish you would have known before you actually built our subgraph? Like if you could go back to the beginning or if you're like talking to someone who's like just about to build their dApps or protocol subgraph, like what advice would you have for them? Um, wait for matchstick unit testing framework to come out. <laughs> yeah, so when I started writing the subgraph, um, RCTL Meow asked me to write tests for it. And uh, basically I did. And I wrote these integration tests and it was mostly written in TypeScript. And I would say like 90% of the code is just keeping track of the state and updating the local state in between transactions. So what I would do is execute a transaction, uh, have the subgraph do its thing, uh, and then compare that to local state, right? And this is pretty tedious. And uh, the match match just removes all of this because it just handles all of that for you. It makes the tests way easier to write, uh, way more maintainable, which, which is important, and runs way faster and just improves the de developer experience for uh, testing your subgraphs a lot more. So I would say that's probably uh, the one thing. Everything else, like, you know, uh, I would say like writing the subgraph, the experience of that is really smooth. Um, so in general, it's really nice. But the testing part, when I started, I don't think it was there yet. I had to do that manually. Is Matchstick a, is that a subgraph? Is, is that a graph thing or is that a separate package that somebody else wrote? It's a tooling. So basically that's what I want to like and also say that the graph ecosystem is very big. So the graph is not just Edge and Node as one of the organizations. The graph foundation, which is uh, uh, the entity, uh, like which is a particular foundation, which actually makes sure that all the core devs work has about five core devs, which is Masari, Streaming fast, like, you know, uh, and three others, which actually make sure that the graph works. And it is, I would say the tooling is similar to Ethereum. When Ethereum came into picture, it had a very limited amount of tooling, right? We had Remix, which worked once in 10 days. We had, uh, now everything works awesome, so it's good. The Truffle was okay. -ish. Eventually, Hard Hat came into picture and stuff like that. Similarly, the graph ecosystem, when initially it had like, you know, uh, some kind of tooling to help around, but there was much more that was required. And Matchstick was one such unit testing framework that came in. But there are more like graph client and the graph CLI improvement and stuff like that, that has made subgraph development much, much more easier. But I still feel there is a lot that needs to be done so that we can make you know, subgraph deployment much, 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 much better and much like, you know, uh, more of a sweet drive for everybody wanting to uh, index information. Uh, I would also want to share a small, like, you know, incident. So basically when the graph launched uh, on the graph day, we did not have graph code gen and Vincent would know about it. So basically what happened was when you do graph init dash dash index events, nothing would happen. You would have to get all the schemas, all the YAML file, everything created on your own at like, you know, from, from the start. Then people in the graph yeah, team, uh, by, the, by back then it was, you know, one team, worked on the whole CLI and made changes so that it could auto-generate code. And uh, like, you know, that's how things started working. So basically we came from nothing and now we have the right tools and many more supporting tools to make your subgraph development experience better. But I still think, uh, like, you know, there is so much that we can do uh, to make indexing a reality. And I think we are not close to what Web2 tooling has been. And that's for all the whole Web3. The Web2 supportive docs and the Web2 supporting tooling to making uh, infrastructure work. Uh, and I think we are working on the right directions to make tooling happen for uh, developer life to be easier. I love it. Yeah, you guys definitely have come a long way. And I think that, uh, you know, even in Vincent's case, like his life has been made better. Yeah. 
in a very yeah, short period of time. Matchstick is like the foundry for the subgraph. <laughs> it's like foundry for subgraph, for sure. Cool. Uh, so one that I just wanted to follow up with on on what we just discussed is what would you like to see people build? Like what new pieces of tooling uh, do you think it'd be great to have some outside development help come in and, and build as an open source project? Uh, there is so much that needs to be done and like, you know, so little time in Web3 we have. One year is like 10 years in Web3 I've seen in my past experience and in the present experience as well. So there, there, there are a lot of dream, dream projects that I personally am so much attested to in general. So basically, we have, uh, so basically like, you know, when you initially had Dreamix, you had to have MetaMask and everything needs to be installed to do everything, right? And then they introduced this Remix VMwares so that you could just deploy a contract on a virtual particular place, check everything works and then go ahead, right? Similarly, in the current context, the graph, has matchstick but you know um, until you deploy the subgraph on the hosted service and it's like sync 99 percent taking seven days you don't know if it is gonna error out for a particular mapping you know so there are toolings that we could develop just like react remix vm wares to make sure that particular thing is solved for and we are not like you know on 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 rough edges over there that's one Second would be, I think uh, uh, there is a lot of AI magic that can be done on the graph. So basically graph gets you information from blockchain, which is open source, 10 TB of data for let's say this Polygon, just uh, Ethereum, just BSC. That 10 TB of data queried via the graph in GraphQL format, put in the right kind of models can do a lot of magic in the whole ecosystem. It can, you know, uh, do an auto yearn finance kind of a thing for you. It can build those kind of things. So basically building on top of the graph on their querying magic of the 10 TB data that exists open source is like, you know, definitely a dream that needs to, uh, that, that, that I really see coming forward. Maybe like a graph GPT star sort of a thing. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, third would be, uh, in my belief, uh, we have we have done a good job in you know indexer uh, tooling, and uh, a lot has been done to improve upon that. And uh, we have the indexer agent. We have indexed a lot of tooling around that. But I think we could make their lives much more easier by you know having introducing packages so things could run with Grafana with Prometheus in one go without a problem right now there are people who have worked on it but i think we could do better in those kind of uh, environments and give people the right kind of uh, uh, like visualizations of their indexing information so lot to do uh, and uh, so little that we have uh, so we, we've come a long way and a long way to go that's what i would say yeah i think that yeah, if someone's looking to build something open source, I think this is definitely a good area to look. Um, again, building open source projects, great way to to learn, great way to meet people, great way to maybe even get jobs and things like that. So definitely support that. But yeah, listen, we, we really appreciate you coming on today. The last question we tend to ask guests is far more zoomed out. But you know, if, if we again, zoom way out and we think like very long term over the next five or 10 years, how do you hope our industry evolves? I mean, it sounds like you and the rest of the graph team are really bullish on the decentralized network, right? That'll be a big step towards decentralization for the entire space. But even more broadly, like, like what do you hope things look like in 2033? Yeah. Well, one, one particular, like, you know, really, uh, maybe a little cocky, but I would say, uh, one one particular statement I personally believe in is that decentralization is not the right way. Decentralization is the only way uh, for Web3 to really happen. And uh, I totally am attested to that particular thing. But I know that peer-to-peer -peer systems are tough to make decisions on. But I feel that's where the society really becomes much, much more mature. Right, democracies of the world have shown how humanitarianism can actually work, and that's being implemented in technology in a way. So 
I would say in the current scenarios, we are doing a great job, but we should never leave upon our, like, you know, our, 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 our thing that we came here for, which was, which is, and which will always be decentralization. While we make an improvement in UIs, we make an improvement in all the wallet formats that we have created, like account abstraction that is coming along and stuff like that. So better onboarding, easier onboarding, leading to mass adoption while we still have the decentralized scope of work going along. And I think mobile coming to the Web3 picture is going to really, really help. So I feel in 2030, we will use blockchains without, you know, uh, we will use blockchains without thinking that we are on blockchain, just like we are on internet right now. We don't think that we are serving something from HTTPS. We're just there and it's such a natural thing from mobile to laptops and everything. Similarly, by 2030, with these like, you know, protocols and tools like Graph, Superfluid, Ethereum blockchain, all the layer tools that are coming along, we should have an ecosystem that is so seamless that we are in a decentralized world with without realizing we are interacting with p2p much much more like you know uh, finer better but in a which, which opens a new scope of doing things right for example uh, internet has scoped out for us to do remote work similarly web3 and the in game currency is going to scope out so many new things and that's where i feel 2030 vision should be decentralization with a new scope of like, you know, uh, financing out things while uh, uh, the UI is so seamless that everybody uses Web3 without realizing it's Web3. That's a fantastic answer. Um, the sentiment that we hope that we're building on top of blockchains without knowing we're building on top of blockchains, that's a very common one that, that's uh, been a common thread amongst all the technologists and people we've had on here. So hopefully we get there. But uh, it's gonna be it's going to be a long journey. Uh, and yeah, we're, uh, we're happy we had you on today to share some of your knowledge about the graph. Vincent, thank you for joining us as well. It was great to give our listeners some insight into how to actually build a subgraph, uh, like tactically and how we think about it as super fluid. But, uh, yeah, thank you guys for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks, Sam.